All right, everyone here? We good? Good to see everybody tonight. We're going to pick up right where we left off. So if you'll turn with me to Revelation chapter 11. So just to, to quickly review what we've done, we've had John um, getting this revelation from Jesus. And then we've had the messages to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. And then chapters 4 and 5, we see this worship service going on in heaven And we believe that represents the fact that the church has been taken into heaven at that point because in chapters 2 and 3, they're on earth getting preached to. In chapters 4 and 5, they're in heaven worshiping. And you see um, a a picture of the Trinity, and then you see the the scroll that um, John began to cry because no one could even, was worthy to take the scroll and open it. Jesus comes out and is worthy to do it and opens it. And then those seals, as he opens those seals on the scroll, we got the, the seven seals. And we talked about the different judgments that came with those. And then we, last week, talked about the trumpet judgments. And we went through six of those. And um, now we have what we call this interlude. It's like if you're reading a book and they put something in parentheses. Or if you're watching a movie and it, it gives you some foreshadowing of something that's going to come. And then it goes back. So I'm going to do my best to explain this tonight. But chapter 11... The Bible says, I, this is John, <clears throat> then I was given a measuring rod like a staff. Oh, that's great. So I need to go in my mouth. That'd be great. <clears throat> anyway, I'll, I'll try that again. <laughs> so I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out. For it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. If all I get done tonight are these two verses, there's so much here. First of all, I'm going to say again, there's more than one way to look at this. And even as I go through study Bibles, because they don't rightfully know for sure, they list every possible scenario Well, I tend to to lean certain ways, but let me, some people believe this represents the church. Well, I'm going to give you my opinion here. I'm having a hard time seeing that because he's describing a temple. Why not describe the church instead? And, but so I, I believe this is speaking of a temple that has to exist again for certain things to come to pass in the Bible. It corresponds with Daniel and in particularly next week, We'll begin to look at Daniel more because it goes right along with this. But we have this temple that at some point will, there will be a temple in Jerusalem again. He mentions the holy city and he mentions the fact that for 42 months it will be given over to the Gentiles, okay, and trampled. Well, Daniel very clearly um, states that the great tribulation, that portion of it will last um, for three and a half years. The whole thing lasts for seven years. So we have him here measuring the temple. Um, And in verse 3, he says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. That is huge to interpreting this passage. There's no coincidence that the exact number of days here matches the exact number of days that God gave Daniel. Okay, that would be the time of Jacob's trouble or the Great Tribulation putting 30 days to a month, as would have been done um, with this portion, that is exactly three and a half years. Okay, so you get, so this, these two witnesses will minister on the earth for three and a half years, and very likely, because it corresponds with the time Daniel talked about, we're talking about the second half. So where we are biblically in this chapter is we've reached the halfway moment point of the tribulation, and the next several chapters are going to be surrounded around events that occur during this halfway mark and that spark the rest of the tribulation. So, and, and so who are these witnesses? Well, let me give you what the scripture says. Verse 4 says, These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. <coughs> Excuse me. That comes directly out of Zechariah. And I have the scripture right here, and it's gone. I'll find it again in a minute, so I can read you that scripture. 
But um, Zechariah, here we go. Zechariah 4.11, Zechariah sees this vision of these two olive trees um, on the right side and the left, stand, the left side of the lampstand in heaven. And, and he asks who these are. <laughs> and he asks, what are these two olive trees? And then he said, the messenger to him, this is out of Zechariah chapter 4, said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the word of the whole earth. So who are we? That We can't say with 100% certainty, but we have a pretty good idea of who they are. One is almost without a doubt Elijah for two reasons. Number one, Elijah was called into heaven and never died. We know the story of the Old Testament, a chariot of fire. He was called into heaven. And then the book of Malachi says this, the last two verses of the Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great day of the Lord. Okay. Kind of hard to say anything else. Okay, now, now, John, we understand that Jesus, part of that was fulfilled in John the Baptist because Jesus says, if you can handle this, this is Elijah the prophet that was foretold, meaning the spirit of Elijah was upon John. But he wasn't Elijah himself. In fact, he denied that. He wasn't Elijah himself. So I believe, very clearly, Elijah is one of these. There's some dispute, and rightfully so, over who the other one is. Um, there's a strong case for both Moses and for Enoch. There's a case for Moses because when Jesus went to the Mount of Transfiguration, he saw, and so did Peter, James, and John, Elijah and Moses. Now, Moses died, you know, but there's nothing to say that God can't send him back. So there's a very strong case that one is Moses. There's another case that one is Enoch, who was the seventh from Adam. We know next to nothing about Enoch. He's mentioned in Genesis, and he's mentioned in Jude. And that's about all we know. What we know from Genesis, the Bible says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And some people use the scripture that it is appointed as a man once to die and after death the judgment to, to say that God has to send Elijah and, and Moses, not Moses, Enoch back. Well, not necessarily. God can choose what he wants to do. But there is a strong case that one of them is Enoch because the Bible calls him a prophet. And he was a prophet of righteousness. And he actually, according to the book of Jude, we don't have those writings. At some, we don't have all of those writings. They were lost to time. But Jude quoted out of the book of Enoch and said that Enoch prophesied that the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. So, so we don't know for sure who they are, but probably two of those three men is who these two witnesses will be that will come back to preach upon the earth during those last days. And the Bible says, if anyone would harm them, that fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. Imagine. And if anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. Now you imagine that. Again, there are other well-meaning people who, who have tried to explain that away with, as some allegory. I, yeah, there's allegory in the Bible. Okay, There's symbolism in the Bible. We're going to talk about it tonight. I don't see this as symbolism. I believe the best way to interpret the Bible is you interpret it literally unless very clearly it's not. Okay? So, and, and I have no reason to believe this is not a literal event that will happen. And the Bible says they have power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. Well, God gave authority to Elijah. It didn't rain for three and a half years in Israel during the days of Ahab. Sound familiar? Because they had turned on him. So we have here now, it says um, that they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood. There's another case for Moses. Okay, I, we're, I mean, so again, I don't know. I'm not here to tell you because I don't know who they are. I do believe one is absolutely Elijah. I do. I believe it's right in front of us. The other, we don't know. There's a case for both. So, um, but anyway, it says they have powers over the water to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Why would God allow that? Because it's judgment. God withholds judgment for a long time. And, I'm, and I know I, I say this often, but I'm going to say it again. When he gave Abraham the promise that I'm going to give this land to your descendants, that you're going to multiply as the stars of the heaven, he said, but the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet to the full. It was some 400 years later 
before the Israelites walked back into Canaan to take it over. Because even though God knew the people of the land was, was not going to repent, He still gave them time. You don't see instant judgment, usually. Okay, God gives people a space to repent. We see that, thank God, <laughs> that He gives us a space to repent. But at this point, the people have rejected And we read about that last week. He said the mystery of God will be finished and there would be no more delay. And we read that when that sixth trumpet sounded and all those disasters were happening, that they didn't repent of any of their sins. They blasphemed God instead. So these are people who have been utterly rejected because they rejected Him. And, and, I, and don't make a mistake about that. God is a loving God, but He is a righteous God who will someday pour out judgment. Verse 7, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. No one will be able to harm them during those, the time of their their ministry. But when God is finished, they will be martyred for the sake. Next week, we will go into great, great detail from the Bible about the, about the beast. But I'm here to tell you, this symbolizes the Antichrist and his empire. Okay, so this kingdom will make war on them and will kill them. And the Bible says their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city. That symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt where their Lord was crucified. This means they will preach out of Jerusalem. But during that day, the, 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 that city will have become so debased that it's going to be spiritually Sodom and Egypt. Now, why you think about, okay, when you hear the name Egypt, what immediately comes to your mind? Okay, the plagues. Okay, because Egypt was an ultimate sign of wickedness. In the scriptures, you know, they were pagans. They worshipped everything under the sun. They held the Israelites in captivity and slavery. And, and what good thing ever came out of Egypt in the scriptures? Okay? <laughs> I mean, really. And then you see Sodom. Well, we know Sodom. Okay? They were judged because not even ten righteous people could be found in it. Mainly for sins of homosexuality. But more than that, they were just uh, debauched people that lived in that city and they were judged. And God was referring to Jerusalem just as that at, that at the time that this will happen. Now you think about this. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. This is how hate-filled the world will have become. They won't even allow their bodies to be buried. But for three and a half days, they'll celebrate while these prophets are dead in the streets. And it says, And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. You imagine that. I remember when um, on 9-11 watching news broadcasts of, of, of people who hated the United States dancing in the streets when those towers came down and we lost 3,500 people that day. But imagine the whole world doing something like that. That was a select group. Imagine the world celebrating because two prophets of God are dead. But it doesn't stop there. After three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them. And they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. There'll be no denying what has just taken place. So in essence, that they've been resurrected, just like the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain, this happens to them. They come, they die in a physical body, and they're going to be, get, they're going to be resurrected, just like all the other saints. And they're called back into heaven. And the Bible says at that hour, and I, I could be wrong about my timing here. I don't believe I am based on my studies. I promise I'm going to try my best to get you guys a document of a timeline. Allison asked me to do that, and I've not done it, and I need to do it, uh, of what I see the timeline is in this book and what I've studied th for years. But this likely is happening just before the return of the Lord, literally. I don't mean like, I mean literally. Literally. And the days and hours before he returns. 
because they have they prophesy for the 1260 days and and you know what the book of daniel counts the days of, of the tribulation it num numbers the years and counts the days so this is likely happening at about the time the Lord's going to return. It says, at that hour there was a great earthquake. And we're going to read, if I'm right, um, this is an earthquake that the Bible is going to describe again later on. But there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. It's about the first time we've seen that happen in this book. Now, all of that was to describe the ministry of these prophets that will take place during the last part of the tribulation period. Okay? And then it goes back to what we were talking about. So I know that's confusing, but take everything we've talked about and, and put it over here for a minute and then go back to where we left off last week. And an, an eagle flying through the heavens saying, whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth because of the three trumpets that are yet to sound. And we had the, sixth, the fifth trumpet sound, and then we had these demonic locusts released out of hell, essentially. And then we had the sixth trumpet sound, and then we had the, this other group of demonic horsemen coming up on the earth, and all this chaos taking place. That was the second woe, and now we're going back to that. And the Bible says the second woe has passed. That's not referring to the witnesses. It's referring back to the sixth trumpet. And, 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 and we know that from the order of the Scripture. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. And now we get the third woe, which is about to happen here in chapter 12. Ch oh, actually, still chapter 11. So again, that all was talking about a ministry that will take place for three and a half years. The seventh angel blowing his trumpet is, is an instant thing that happens in a succession. So it says here in verse 15, the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Some people, and they may be right, believe this is, will be the, the trumpet that sounds the return of the Lord. I struggle with that interpretation a little bit because there's a whole lot of Bible still left after this. There are other events that have to happen after this. And um, so I, I personally don't believe it's referring to that. But the reason they're saying this, and I get it, is because it says the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Well, here's how I, I, I take this. Think back to July 4th, 1776, when the, the founding fathers decided we were going to be an independent nation. They signed a document that day that in essence said we're free from England, but it was some years later before that really happened. That was a statement, but they, the consummation didn't happen then. There was a war. <laughs> That took place first. Well, I see the same thing here. Well, we, we read last week, there be no more delay. The mystery of God's finished, meaning it's over. Now I'm going to finish my work. Okay, and what we see from this point on are the final judgments and the actual literal return of the Lord. So this is the announcement, although it, there, it's still a little bit away before the actual event happens. That's how I see this. And it says the 24 elders, those are the same 24 we read about in chapter 4, who sat on their thrones before God, fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came for the time of the dead to be judged and for the rewarding of your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. They're worshiping God because the time has come. God is going to finish his judgment and he is going to set up his kingdom. And they are praising him in heaven, not because people are dying, but because justice is being done and the will of God is being fulfilled. And then we go back to heaven again. God's temple in heaven was open. There is a literal temple in heaven. Very clear throughout the scriptures. A literal temple in heaven. And that's how God, that's, that's the pattern that God gave to Moses and to David and Solomon as they built the tabernacle and the temple on earth. And so the temple in heaven was opened and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. So there's an ark of the covenant in heaven. I personally believe that represents his throne just because the mercy seat on earth represented his throne. But it says there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Probably not heavy hail in heaven. 
Okay, so we're seeing the flashes of lightning and thunder. That's, that's the same thing we saw on Mount Sinai. Okay, but the earthquake and heavy hail is very likely on earth, not in heaven. Okay, so we see that events in heaven directly relate to what's going on on earth, not the other way around. So, let me go on to chapter 12. It's a tough chapter to understand. It is, and I want to do my best. It, it, but, so let's just, let's just hit it. Chapter 12. It says, A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. This is not the first time we've seen a vision of the sun and the moon and the twelve stars. It's what Joseph dreamed. And in his dream, that represented his father, his mother, and his brothers, which were the beginning of the nation of Israel. So this is an absolute symbol of the nation of Israel. And, and so we have to understand that she was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And there appeared another sign in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems or crowns. This, yes, the, I mean very clearly later, we're gonna, this is Satan, it also, but the seven heads and ten horns are representation of the kingdom of the Antichrist, whom Satan is literally behind. And we're going to talk about the spiritual warfare next week. But I'll, I'll tell you just enough this week, and I'm going to show you this in the Bible. Don't take my word for it. There are fallen angels behind empires and kingdoms, even as we speak on this earth. We see it in Daniel. We see it here. Satan himself will be behind the Antichrist. I know we, I've said it, well, the devil's fault me, and that he probably hasn't. Satan is not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at one time. While you might get, um, while we all have encountered things that have certainly been demonically influenced, it's unlikely that Satan himself was buffeting you. He doesn't have time. He can't be everywhere at one time. He, he, he's, so, but here, he absolutely is behind this man. Absolutely. And the Bible says his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. This is difficult to understand. But the following verses, I hope, will help you see this. Most people that I've read, and I, and I tend to see this, believe this is representation of, of the angels that sided with Satan in his original rebellion. The fact that he cast down a third of the stars of heaven. This isn't literally casting down stars. Okay, this isn't a meteor shower. We, John is describing something in the invisible world. Okay, we do know angels sided with him. We know that from the Bible. And the Bible says, The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Now, it's been interpreted that this is representing Mary and Jesus. And while it could allude to that to an extent, this is a future event. Now, yes, you know what? Satan tried to stop Jesus from being born in the first place through Herod. Okay? He, he didn't... You understand from the time of the garden, it was made clear that there was going to be a seed of the woman that would come and destroy him. He didn't know how it was going to happen, but he heard the word of the Lord enough to know. And you see in history the times he tried to stop the, the, the pure seed of Israel. That he tried to stop it by having them intermingle with one another, with other nations, and, and, and to try to pollute the seed of Israel. He tried to stop it by creating races of giants. He didn't create anything, but by a lot, the races of the giants that we've talked about. And if this is the first time you've heard this, you can read in Genesis that it was fallen angels and women who intermingled. And that's where the giants came from. There's a special on TV right now. I don't know if it's any good. I've only watched about five minutes of it. Uh, it's a documentary. On, on the fossils of the giants. Now that's going to get hidden, and, and it, it may be completely false. It may be junk. I've not watched it. But we know from the Bible they existed. Multiple, multiple groups of them when you read the Bible. So he tried it that way. He tried it with Haman to try to wipe out all of Israel through his false edict. It failed. He tried it with Herod. He, it failed. He tr thought he won when he thought when the Lord died. It all failed. So what I believe this is representing is we, we, very clearly the nation of Israel. But what is the Israel birthing? Probably the remnant. I think we're talking about that remnant who will come to him in the end. The Bible's really clear 
that a remnant of Israel will, will serve him and will accept the Lord, even at the time of the end. Israel today as a nation, we should support them because they're still the seed of God. I don't believe in replacement theology. While, yes, we've been grafted in, biblically speaking, Israel still has a place in the, in, in the, in the grand scheme of God. And we have to understand that right now, however, they're a secular nation. Many of them, although they would refer to themselves as Jews, they don't even practice Judaism. And, 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 and if you're practicing Judaism, you don't believe in Jesus. I'm not knocking the Jews. I'm not. But I'm just saying, as a Christian, I can't accept that. I mean, they've got a right to worship if that's what they want to do. But I'm saying, I can't accept that as gospel because Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, doesn't believe he was the Messiah. Okay? So, but there will be a group who will. And Satan doesn't want that to happen. And here you see him, the dragon standing before her who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. And she gave birth to the male child. The remnant will come. One who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Well, what, well, again, that's being used. Well, this is Jesus. Well, again, yeah, I believe there's some flashback here and some, some connections. But the Bible tells, we read about this in chapters 2 and 3. He who overcomes, I will give to him to rule with a rod of iron. These are overcomers that will rule and reign with Jesus in his kingdom. And so he, but it says her child was called up to God and to his throne. Now, let, let's stop there a minute because that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot to talk about. So yes, there's a remnant. There is a remnant that's going to come to the Lord. But this particular group is not just, it's part of the remnant, but it's a specific group of people because we see them caught up to the Lord, beings they've been raptured. There's going to be some on earth, and I know this goes against everything we grew up learning, but the Bible's really clear. When they see Jesus coming back, and I'm talking about Jewish people in Israel, the Bible says that they will ask him, where did you get these wounds? And he'll tell them, I got it in the house of my friends. That goes against everything I know we always were taught. But there's going to be some of the seed of Israel who will realize who he is at that time. Read Matthew chapter 25. Don't take my word for this. Read it. And there's going to be a remnant who will serve him and who will enter the kingdom. So who are these? If they're not the ones who make it all the way, this, these are the 144,000 we were talking about. And I will prove that through the Scripture. I'm not proving anything. I'll give you the Bible when we get to it. You're going to see this same group standing in heaven. A few chapters ago, they were getting sealed, which represents God's ownership of them, that they had come to salvation. And it also protected them from the plagues that were coming. Because if you remember a few chapters ago, it, uh, God saw there were these angels holding back the four winds, which represented judgment. And he commanded them, you don't release these judgments until I've sealed these 144,000. And, and the Bible doesn't tell us what they do, but clearly they're going to be out proclaiming the gospel. They're going to be doing that. But Satan doesn't like it, and he's going to try to kill them. But God is going to call them up. And in a few chapters, we're going to see them standing in heaven. So that is who those are. I'm convinced of that 100%. So I know that's a lot. I know that it is. And if I need to go through it again one day, I will. I know that's a lot. And then chapter verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Oh my goodness. I won't have time to unpack this tonight. But in the book of Daniel, you see a place where Israel will flee to get away from the Antichrist. And John sees this same place. I will tell you this, and we're going to read this in the Bible, in, hopefully next week. At the halfway point of the tribulation, this man who has come in peace, who seemingly Israel even has thought he would be their Messiah, I believe that's what Jesus spoke of when he told them, he says, I come in my Father's name and you don't accept me. One will come in his own name and him you'll accept. I believe that's who he was talking about. The world's going to surround this man because he's going to He's going to bring a false peace. That's what starts the time clock. 
in the book of Daniel. He will sign a treaty with many, the Bible says, a covenant with many. But at the halfway point, and again, we will read this in Daniel specifically, he is going to declare openly that he serves no God, but that he really himself is God. He will declare himself above all. The book of Daniel says he will set his throne in the Holy of Holies of the new temple. Jesus spoke of it. He called it the abomination of desolation. Daniel prophesied it. That will happen at that time. And he will come against Israel with a fury. That's what we're seeing right here. We're seeing in the spirit realm what will happen through a physical man. Here we see what's happening in the spirit world. Daniel will show you what's happening in the physical world. But it's the same event. And he will try to destroy them, but God is going to protect them. And in fact, and I'll have to give you the scripture on this later, probably the place it's going to be we would, we would call modern day Petra, which was the ancient land of Edom, which was Jacob's brother, which means in the end, that relationship that was broken thousands of years ago is going to be healed. The people, the descendants of Esau, will be the ones who protected them in the natural. And I'll have to give you a Bible on that when we get to Daniel. Hope, I hope that made sense, though. So they're going to be protected. And now, we're again, we're seeing spiritual warfare here. We'll later see what it's, what's taking place on earth. But it says war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great red dragon was thrown down. I'm sorry, the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent, who was called the devil, and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. What is this telling me? We know from scripture, particularly the book of Job and some others, that for whatever reason, Satan has access to the throne of God. He went before God to tempt Job. You read that in the Bible. He went before God. We understand the Bible says that, that he is called the accuser of the brethren, that he is standing and he is accusing you and me and the, the people of God day and night before the throne. Why God has allowed him to have continued access into heaven, I don't know. But he loses it here. There will, there will be a literal war in the spirit realm where he and his fallen angels will no longer have access to heaven or their domains in the heavens. I, I don't understand all that. I don't pretend to. I know that Paul said that we wrestle against spirits of wickedness in the heavenlies. They lose that access, but where are they coming to the earth? And you will now see a time that is unprecedented upon the earth. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and the sea. This is the third woe. For the devil has come down to you in great fury, for he knows that his time is short." And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown to the earth, he pursued the woman who had been given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle, so she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. Three and a half years. I'll explain that from Daniel, but that's what that means. You keep seeing that same time period over and over and over. So he's going, I don't know what the wings of the great eagle represent. I don't know. I can't, but God is going to supernaturally deliver Israel from their harm. Now, I am going to say this. In Matthew chapter 24, the disciples are asking Jesus, what will the signs of the end of the age be? And he gets to a point 
when he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. And then it even goes far to say, he who reads, let him understand. He says, if you're on the housetop, don't come back down and get your stuff out of the house, basically. He says, if you're out here, don't, don't go back to get your stuff. Don't do this. Don't stop. Run. Is what he told them. He says, pray that your flight not come on the Sabbath day. Your flight, meaning they're going to have to flee for their lives at that event when Antichrist openly declares himself. That's what Jesus was talking about. We're seeing this in the spirit realm here, what's about to take place. And he said, run for your life. He said, pray that you're not pregnant in those days. Think how hard it is for a pregnant lady to travel. Or for people, he said, if, you're, if you are still nursing your child, pray that you're not in those days. Because there'll be no mercy on those people that can't escape. Orthodox Jews will not do anything hardly on the Sabbath day. So they would they be afraid to even travel that kind of a distance, thinking they were breaking a law. And that's why Jesus said that. Because they will have to run for their life. But God will protect a remnant of them. And the Bible says, and I don't know what this means, I just know it means that the enemy is going to try to destroy them and God's going to stop it. The serpent poured water out like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. Probably that's not literal. This is because we're seeing in the spirit world. This is all spiritual. But the earth came to, to the help of the woman and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Some people have interpreted this to be that an army will chase them and God will swallow them up. And he could... Look what he did to Korah and to the rebels in, 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 the, in, in Numbers. Okay, that tried to overthrow the priesthood. He swallowed them up in the earth. And he, he very well can do that. And the Bible says, Then the dragon became furious with the woman. And again, the woman is Israel. I, I'm very confident in saying that. Went off to make war on the rest of her offspring and those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. And I will stop there. Chapter 13, next week, we're going to really see what happens when Antichrist really declares his colors. And we're going to see a glimpse into the spirit world that is almost too much to comprehend <laughs> when we really see what is going on. And, and I read a scripture last week. The Bible said it's by his mercies that we're not consumed. If it weren't for the hand of God, we don't need to fear as believers. You've got nothing to be afraid of as believers. But imagine if, if the hand of God was not there to prevent the things going on that we don't even see. There is an invisible world that we don't see. And that's where the real action is taking place. It is. Time and time again. Go and you can, you can look. Let me give you an example from a story in the Bible. Remember during the days of Elisha, um, how the Syrians came to get him. They came to get him because he was going and telling the king of Israel where the, the king of Assyria was going to attack because God was revealing it to him. And they wanted him dead. So they came to get him. And so God said, so that the people were in a panic and, and, and Elisha said, those that are with us are more than are with them because he saw a heavenly army that was there that the people couldn't see. And that army came and blinded the Assyrians blinded the whole army. And then Elisha led them in <laughs> into the city where the king's soldiers could surround them. <laughs> so um, um, that happened then. That There are testimonies of events even in modern times that happened to Israel. Like in, in the 60s when Egypt tried to take over Israel again, how Egyptians just cast their weapons down because they, they, these are pagan people who do not believe in God who said they saw angels standing behind the, the, the Israel soldiers. That, that's in modern times. Now, I can't prove that, but why would someone who doesn't even believe in God make that up? Why would they say that? Anyway, we're going to unpack that next week. So I'm going to stop there. I know this is hard. It's hard for me. And if, 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 if I have confused anyone, I'll do my best to undo the damage. But if you have any questions, I'll try to take those right now. So.